Hello, you're watching Tell It Like It Is with public officials, and my name is Kathy Benick. And as you can see to my right, because the camera says all, we have uh, Representative Laurie Sanborn here. And actually, Laurie is also the House Republican policy leader up at the State House, so she has a lot of inside track information on all kinds of things. And Laurie is our only rep from Bedford that is what they call a floatarial rep in that she also represents the town of Amherst and that all came about when they kind of carved out all the new districts and such. Uh, so she kind of got a double challenge. And um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I signed up for, yeah, so signed up for yes. it. So, you know, now you're in it. Yep. Um, so in any event, I know you've seen her picture in the paper and in the news and on Patch. Um, that she's been very, very active, so it seemed like a perfect time to get her here to kind of give us an update on what's hot at the state house and all the things we can expect or hopefully not expect to happen. <laughs> um, so, Laurie, <laughs> there's the always back. a lot going on. So, thank you very much yeah. for having me, and it's great to be able to keep in touch with the viewers and let them know what's going on. In the yes, state house. yeah. Now, the last time um, you were on, you were still a candidate. Yes, I was. Yeah, and so, so now, you know, it's amazing how quickly everything happens right after the election. I know. Now you're suddenly constantly in committee meetings and you're making votes and you're trying to also work on the budget so there's a lot to be done and you know Andy and I my husband Andy State Senator Andy Sanborn and I are at the State House five days a week trying to yeah. trying to make our state a better place to find a job and earn a living. So. Yeah and then somewhere in between you also are trying to run your business. We are so trying life, to run a business too. Life so. gets a little crazy <laughs> doesn't it? Huh? But it's what we signed up for you know we really care about the state so much yeah. and uh, so we're there to try to solve the real problems that everyone faces. So. Now have you seen much of a difference representing Bedford than the district you used to represent in your former residence? Yeah, well, as you know, I, for 20 years I lived in Henniker, yeah. and uh, so I represented Henniker and Bradford for two years, mm -hmm. uh, which I loved. Um, but it is different. Bedford yeah. issues are different, and I think that is true for every uh, every district, that they mm -hmm. have their own issues. And Amherst is even a little bit different from Bedford as well. So it's important that we have this kind of dialogue that people feel comfortable, that they can reach mm -hmm. out to me anytime and let me mm -hmm. know the specific concerns that we have here in Bedford. And it's been, you know, it's been fun and interesting to go to town council meetings, to go to school board meetings. Yeah, I saw you the other night yeah. on TV. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and to be you know, involved in the community, Bedford Women's Group and other clubs, mm -hmm. uh, but just to find out what's really important to the people here. Mm -hmm. Have you been hearing from a lot of constituents? Yes, I have. Yeah, yeah. and I but I reach out to them as well because yeah. I really do want. Oh to yeah, make you, sure. both you and Andy are, are yes. constantly out there but, making contact. you know, we contact. get emails and phone calls all the time on the hot button issues, the big mm -hmm. stuff that people you know, with more controversial issues such as gambling and mm -hmm. medical marijuana. Oh yeah, and we things have to like talk that. about that. So yeah. we hear from people uh, on those things, but sometimes mm -hmm. we don't hear on the little things. But I encourage people that if you have mm -hmm. a concern, you see a bill coming that you think would affect you positively or negatively. I need to know that. Well, yeah, because, I mean, if you don't get input. That's right. And it's hard because we, we have actually less bills this year than we have in the past. The last two years, I think we had over 1,000 bills each year. Yeah. Uh, this year we have about 650. Wow. So it's a lot wow. less. Is that due to a lot of new Legislators coming Hardly. in? Hardly. I think there was a surprise. I think Republicans that had expected to be reelected were yeah. not. And yeah. so we have a lot yeah. of new people coming in that were not expecting to come in. Right. And we had people who right. were expecting to come back that didn't. Yeah. And so for those reasons, uh, there's just less bills. Yeah. But it's also a budget Well, that's year, good news in a way. It's a lot less work, <laughs> <laughs> which is nice. But, you know, you know, you want it to be good quality legislation. Mm -hmm. You want to spend the proper amount of time mm -hmm. on every single bill mm -hmm. to vet it carefully. And with less bills, we can do a better job at that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because everything has to go to hearing, no matter how everything, foolish it might be. Yep, and I think a lot of people don't realize I know. that in New Hampshire, unlike other states, every single bill goes to a full yes. public hearing, yes. gets the full light of day, and has a vote. So you can find out how mm -hmm. your, your legislator voted on an issue. So other states, I know, they just kind of put things under the rug and oh, yeah. it doesn't get discussed. But Never, every never will vote. find its way out of the committee office. Right. Right. So but the but word even. Different in New yeah. Hampshire. It's very, yeah. very, everything's supposed to be transparent and accountable. Well, it's, you know, the, the slower, no, the shorter number of bills, too, enables you to really focus on the important things instead of having to spend hours and hours and hours reading and digesting right. some of these, what can be lengthy bills about nothing. Well, the, all bills have a purpose. Well, you know, yeah, and but they sometimes are, they're just somebody's 
wacky idea, too. Could be, Truth although be told. I can tell and you. And you're going to be diplomatic. <laughs> I know that. <laughs> Every representative is there to represent the people. Yes. Yeah. And if a constituent comes to me with an idea, mm -hmm. and we might try to vet it mm -hmm. uh, before it gets to the state house, but maybe it still needs to be presented so mm -hmm. that people can understand the issue better, even if it doesn't pass. A lot of times that's why bills are presented, to mm -hmm. make sure people are aware of an issue mm -hmm. and start to work on the problem. Mm. Well, that's true. And as I said, I knew you'd have a very diplomatic <laughs> answer to that, you know? I have a ton of respect for absolutely everyone at the State House. This is a volunteer job, as you know, so we get paid $100 yes. a year, less taxes, and less the cost of a what license plate. What did you plate. do with your big 100 bucks this year? Did you, like, go out on a spending spree? No, no, because it ends up being around, I don't know, $80 net. Isn't that and awful? I, um, I think it paid for a dry cleaning bill, so, <laughs> <laughs> so it goes by very quickly. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. yeah, and like a lot of I mean, Massachusetts, it, it can be a full time occupation yeah, for and people. For a lot of other and some I of them get a very good salary. Yeah, yeah, most of the states, this is a profession. For us here, we're just volunteers and we're doing yeah. the best that we can yeah. and we, uh, we beg your forgiveness if we're not doing a perfect job, but we're certainly going to try. So I really have a ton of respect for everyone, both parties, who is giving it their all to try to mm -hmm. solve problems. And it's a huge time commitment, no matter how it you is. cut it, yeah. especially these months of the year. Yeah, some people will only show up maybe one day a week uh, really? or less, yeah. um, which is too bad. But you know what? They have to work for a living mm. or they have well, family yeah. commitments or health issues. Yeah. And uh, But Annie and I made a commitment that we were going to really do this full time. We mm -hmm. can't do this forever. I don't want to be a politician forever. Uh, but we're here to take our turn and do what we can. Well, I don't know. I think you'd be a good U.S. senator or something oh, someday. Geez. <laughs> this is how rumors get started, huh? you know. Well, I mean, it'd be kind of fun. Wouldn't it be fun to have both our U.S. senators with the same last name. That'd be kind of neat. Both U.S. Senators? Yeah. Wouldn't that be kind of fun? <laughs> you know, you and Andy. I mean, you might have to move to different parts of the state yeah, so for that a could while. Yeah, be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> a little moral issue that, there. You know. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just want to do the right thing for the, huh. in the best way that we possibly can. Oh, so. oh I know. Yeah, you're both very dedicated. And yes, I think that, that's what got you the votes in Bedford. Um, because, you know, you weren't long, long time Bedford residents. And, People didn't, a lot of people didn't know either of you, mm -hmm. um, but you went out there and you really made we, it a point to get all over town as and you people know, did and get to know you. As you talked about, we rode the scooters I know, that was funny. Town. That was too funny. Yeah, and we had yeah. a ball doing it. We got yeah. to really talk, have great conversations with people all over town and find out what's important to them, where yeah. they stand on the issues, and mostly listen, less talking and much more listening. Mm -hmm. and, and that's really our job is to serve mm -hmm. the people. Um, we shouldn't be there to pass our particular agenda. Mm -hmm. It really is to take care of the needs. And that made a strong impression on people, and that's why you were both elected by such good votes. Oh, well, good. And I yeah. hope, uh, you know, we'll see what the future brings. But we're here, and we're in the middle of everything. And one thing I want to be sh clear about is, you know, I ran as a Republican. I am a Republican. Uh, but now that I'm elected, I serve er absolutely mm -hmm. everyone. Yeah. I, I don't care what party someone's from. Yeah. If they would like me to know their thoughts or ideas, I am always open, and I want mm -hmm. that feedback because mm -hmm. um, my job is to serve everyone in this town. Well, that's good you said that because I think sometimes, you know, particularly if somebody campaigned for a, a part, you know, an, an opponent in a different party, mm -hmm. they're very hesitant to approach the yeah. victor. And, and I would say, please don't be hesitant. Yeah. Um, I welcome all the feedback. That's good. Yeah. Well, I mean... What's the House Republican agenda this year? Well, obviously, there have been lots of changes in the State House, and you have a you tougher know, job probably changes. this time. Yeah, it is a tougher job. You know, as you probably know, Republicans are in the minority in the yes. House this year, very yeah. different from for the last two years. We yes. had a super majority, so it's a very different uh, climate, if you will. But we still have an agenda because we're still trying to put forth positive solutions to solve the real challenges we face. And of course, the number one issue for us is jobs and the economy, mm -hmm. because that's the number one issue that I think most of our the people are facing today. Yeah, right. Still, even yeah. though we thought we'd be out of the woods by now, we're really not. People are nervous. Mm -hmm. And the Republican solution is to really make sure that uh, government kind of gets out of the way mm -hmm. and is not cause constantly causing barriers mm -hmm. uh, and holding the business community back. You know, we have a lot of great responsible business owners in our state. We have many of them right here in Bedford. And they're just trying to do a great job. They're trying to succeed and they mm -hmm. want to grow. They want to hire. And so we want to do everything we can to encourage that type of thing. So that's the number one issue on our agenda. And so anything we can do to promote that, we certainly we will. And a number two, which is a close second, is uh, responsible budgeting. 
we need to make sure our government is responsible with your money. Well, that opens <laughs> up a whole <laughs> yes, new... Yes, it does. <laughs> yes, it does. Because we all know our new governor has put her budget in. Yes, she and has. And a lot of people have been kind of stymied by the fact that right out the gate, She's depending on $80 million from casinos that haven't been approved yet. Yeah. So let's, well, let's, let's talk get about into that. that. And, yeah. that's, you know, yeah. and, and that extends beyond party. I think people on both sides of the aisle are quite concerned about this governor's budget. That's certainly what comments and, to that know, effect on the union leader this um, morning. Governor Hassan kind of ran a campaign sa mm -hmm. saying that she was just like Governor Lynch. Mm -hmm. And this is the very first early indication she's not anything like John Lynch. John Lynch always presented at least a balanced budget. Mm -hmm. This is not a balanced budget. You cannot have a balanced budget based on $80 million from something that's an illegal activity yeah. currently in the state with no uh. real certainty that it's going to pass. Uh, she kind of put all of her eggs in one basket and so it's putting us in the house in the very difficult position of trying to craft a balanced budget and we're going to have to do it with plan B because the governor has no plan B of what do you do if you don't have this 80 million dollars in free money. Mm -hmm. And it certainly puts Democrats who may be opposed to legalizing gambling into a position. Right. And you know, it's interesting, gambling, especially casino gambling, is not really a partisan issue. You'll see Republicans and Democrats mm -hmm. on both sides yeah. of the issue. Yeah. And uh, you know, to, it, it, it's been presented in front of the House probably two or three dozen times. Mm -hmm. It has never passed. Uh, in fact, Governor Lynch always threatened to veto it mm -hmm. if it ever yeah. made it to his desk. Yeah, he just he did. didn't think it was part of the New Hampshire brand. So you have people all over the map on this mm -hmm. issue, but as you know, Governor Hassan promised mm -hmm. one casino, yep. I think basically in Salem, and so now she's trying to live up to that promise. Yeah. But yeah. it's a hard promise to keep because really she doesn't control the legislature because, mm -hmm. um, of course, you have the uh, Republican uh, minority in the House, but you have a Republican majority mm -hmm. in the Senate. So really it could go any way. Of course. Um, and, you know, I'm, I've personally voted against gambling in the past. Um, and uh, the devil's always in the details. Of what exactly it is. Yes. does this yes. do? Exactly. And there are actually multiple gambling bills in the House right now and in the Senate. And so I don't think people realize that. Yeah, I, yeah. Think I think everybody figures there's just one kind of major bill and well, that will decide There's one it that's all. favored by the governor. So well, that's the I'm one sure. that gets yeah. the attention. Yeah. And there's a few senators who really like this one particular bill, which creates a monopoly. And so regardless of how you feel about gambling, you have to think about, is this something you want to give to one winner? And that, you know, when you pick one winner, you also create losers, which mm -hmm. means there are other, uh, other towns mm -hmm. in the state of New mm -hmm. Hampshire. That's true. In the North Country, maybe at the racetrack in Loudoun, and other places that kind of want to do And she's favoring Salem, correct? She's favoring Salem. And her, um, her design, her budget plan, rests on this sole casino, a very large casino, paying a very large fee up front for the privilege of doing mm -hmm. this in our state, but then paying a very, very low tax compared to every other state on the net gambling Ooh. revenue. Really? So there's a lot of controversy there. So well, again, yeah. whether or not you support gaming, yeah. um, do you support this, this particular paradigm? Yeah. Because there's some problems with it. Well, how fair is that to other businesses? That's a good question. Yeah. <laughs> some would say it's not fair at all. Yeah. And uh, you know, there's some provisions in this bill that would take the money from expanded gambling and actually divvy it out to other parts of the state. So some people like that, mm -hmm. but other people don't think that goes far enough. Mm -hmm. So there is another bill by a Republican in the House who has presented casino bills in the past, and he presents two casinos one in the North Country and one somewhere in the South, but he doesn't specifically pick up Salem. And I'm sure that North Country feels as though that would be a big boost for them. And yes. I mean, certainly they've you know, had a lot of problems up there. They have, and of course their big thing is loss of jobs. Yeah. And so they see this as jobs yeah. there. But it's interesting, you see lots of studies about gambling, and some will show you that it increases some jobs, especially mm -hmm. early on because mm -hmm. of construction and other well, things. Yeah. But, but those are temporary. But long term, right, yeah. long term, yeah. it may or may not pr produce any new net jobs. Mm -hmm. um, because it ends up, a, a large casino mm -hmm. ends up being somewhat of a vortex, and it pulls uh, money from the economy, it pulls consumers mm -hmm. into one big building mm -hmm. with one big mm -hmm. business, mm -hmm. generally from out of state. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and what, when you're pulling that into that vortex, mm -hmm. then you're taking it from the surrounding communities mm -hmm. and businesses. So well, that would true. mean someone yeah, like Copper point. Door yeah. um, would maybe lose some customers because now their customers are leaving yep. and going to, and going casino. to the casino. Right. Huh. Right. Now, do the North Country people feel, and I, I have no idea, this is kind of like a wild question, 
Do they feel as though that that would also be an attraction for Canadians to come down and spend their money? Yes. Yeah, yeah it would be. Yeah, uh, is there gambling in Canada? I don't even know. There is, actually. There in is? Montreal, there is gambling. So the question is, will people come down to New, to New Hampshire? And part of that has to do with the exchange rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah so. because, I mean, we know that a lot of them would come right. into New Hampshire, Maine, and Vermont yeah. to do a lot of different types of shopping. Right. Um, I don't know. Right. You know? So there's, there's so many questions, and we just don't know where it's going. So back to the governor's budget. To rest you know, a big portion of the budget, a big mm -hmm. portion of these, this wish list of spending mm -hmm. on something that doesn't exist and has not passed into law puts us in a very precarious position. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how you could do that. I mean, how can you propose a budget? for money you don't it, have. Well, it's unorthodox, and you've he already probably heard, um, by law, the governor has to present her budget yeah. by February 15th. Yeah. And we got a piece yeah. of that, which we appreciate, but because we really want all the detail, the yeah. policy decisions behind that. And that's that the part, the House Bill 2, correct? House Bill yes. 2, the trailer bill. And yes. that's what we really rely on to try to understand the numbers better so we understand her goals, mm -hmm. uh, and then can make some policy decisions from there. And we still don't have it, and it's been two weeks. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's cause of some angst, because we're making guesses now. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, and you kind of operate with guesses, right. obviously. And we have a hard deadline, you know, just yeah. like her hard deadline. Yeah. We actually yeah. have another deadline because when the House is done with the budget, we send it to the Senate. Mm -hmm. They have the benefit of a little bit more information on incoming revenues, mm -hmm. uh, that more time to understand what bills may or may mm -hmm. not pass. Mm -hmm. Hopefully by then they have the governor's trailer bill, mm -hmm. HB2. So they'll have more information, but we have to give them something. Mm -hmm. That's our job. And then the negotiation starts. And then the negotiations. And of course, we want to get this done by the end of June. Yeah. If we don't, we again, we put, create a huge amount of uncertainty. You know what's happening at the federal level. Mm -hmm. We don't want to create that level of uncertainty mm -hmm. in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. We at least want to tell people, this is how much we expect to come yeah. in. This is how we're thinking about spending it, looking for opportunities for feedback on that. And then we've got to put it into place. Now, she sees that initial $80 million coming from the licensing fees mm -hmm. and such, right? Is that a given, or, or can, especially if it's a monopoly in only one company, can't they say, no, we think $80 million is too much? Well, that is a question. It's in the bill, the bill that's presented by Senator Morse that the governor has favored, mm -hmm. does put an $80 million uh, application fee or license fee. But wouldn't that be negotiable later? Well, it, it would be in law the way it's written now. Yeah. But again, you know, that's to, to have it as a foregone conclusion yeah. without the input of 424 legislators yeah. is a little ambitious. Yeah. Because I think a lot of legislators might want to see it go out to more of a competitive bid mm -hmm. so that maybe we could get even more money mm -hmm. and others would say mm -hmm. it's too high. Because again, this is less than some states but more than others. Mm -hmm. But it's part of a bigger picture. Also, the net revenues on table games mm -hmm. and on the slot machines. Mm -hmm. And so if... But of course, that'd be at least a couple of years down the road. Exactly. And, and you know, honestly, a lot of people don't even think, you know, the governor's basing this license application fee uh, in this budget, which is the next two years. A lot of people don't even think we'll get that in in that period of time. So to assume mm, we're going to get true. that and then any more revenues is really risky. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and again, now say, you know, it does proceed as, as planned and it is that monopoly status. Mm -hmm. And it comes to the point now where the company that will be the monopoly says, you know, yeah, we want to come into New Hampshire, but no way are we paying that $80 million. There would be nothing then to stop new legislative activity from dropping that $80 million down, correct? And, and my concern about gambling is not that I have a problem with people gambling. I'm just really concerned about this one industry, and in this particular case, this one company, mm -hmm. having that much influence over the legislature mm -hmm. and that much influence over our state revenues. So really quickly what we've seen happen in other states is that the this, that big company starts negotiating the tax rates down. Yeah, that's not a good thing. And of course, then the state is put in the predicament. Now we're relying upon those revenues. Yeah. We've made promises, maybe yeah. that we'd yeah. like to keep. And so suddenly, we're now negotiating with this, you know, big monopoly. Yeah. And that that puts us in a very difficult position that I don't like to see. I'm in the Ways and Means Committee, and so we look at revenues from a mm -hmm. variety of different things. And 25% of our revenue comes in from the entire business community. So it's spread across many, many different industries. Mm -hmm. So we protect ourselves from major ups and downs. Mm -hmm. Other states who have created um, special credits for special industries mm -hmm. get themselves into trouble when that particular industry doesn't do well. Didn't that happen, or isn't it happening now in Connecticut? It's happening in a lot of states, yes. Yeah. I don't know specifically no, about Probably Connecticut. New Jersey, too, because, yeah. I mean, Atlantic City 
from what I understand, is having lots of problems now. That's Trump right. even just that. unloaded his big casino for way right. less than well, it was and worth. And that's the other thing. I think a lot of people look at expanded gaming as a panacea, as yeah. a free money that's yeah. going to fall from the sky, and then we can use it for lots of things. But I think the market may be saturated. Mm -hmm. uh, how much more gambling can we take yeah, exactly. in New England? Yeah. And of course, we have Massachusetts, who's uh, already approved expanded yeah. gambling. And Rhode it's Island been, has it now, I believe. Yeah. yeah. And they all, you know, it's taking a long time to get mm -hmm. it all the way through because. Mm -hmm. Of course, everyone, if you approve expanded gaming, you want it to be high, high quality mm -hmm. and very well regulated because you just don't want it to be a mess. You don't mm -hmm. want it to be a social mm -hmm. problem. And so it takes time yeah, of to create it does. this whole government yeah. bureaucracy to deal with this. And, you know, Massachusetts is finding this right now. And, and all the related issues, right. you know, whether it be public safety, traffic. I mean, there's, there's so many other pieces of it. Right. Many factors to consider. And I think just in the last day, New Hampshire Center for Public Policy came up with an expanded report looking at, well, what could we expect? Mm -hmm. I saw that, yeah. And that's intriguing. The numbers were nothing near what the, the proponents were saying. The numbers very different. Yeah. And I bet the governor's shocked right now. Yeah. Because I think, you know, again, she put her eggs in this one yes. basket. And so she's going to be reeling because this study came back and said that especially if Massachusetts puts a casino at Suffolk Downs, um, the net revenue from casino, from a casino to mm -hmm. New Hampshire, could be zero. Wow. Yeah. So that, that's zero. Uh, that's a challenge. Yeah. You know, there's a lot of needs out there, and I think we, we're going to have to be careful about promising money to people if we don't have it. Uh, we have to be careful. And yet, they're not anywhere in there. They're not saying, and you must reduce all of the various budgets and all the different departments and everything by 80 million in case this doesn't work. Yeah, there's no, the governor has not given us an alternative plan, so we're yeah. left trying to figure that out, <laughs> which is hard. <laughs> right, so Incredible. we'll see. Now, what has happened in the past when the Democrats were in control and when Maggie Hassan was a Senate Majority Leader, mm -hmm. um, they had overstated revenues, mm -hmm. very similar yes. to what's happening now. Which is one of the reasons why we have so many problems now. Well, right, and then what happens at the, you know, surprise, at the end of the yeah. budget, suddenly, while we have a major shortfall, yeah. we mm -hmm. had an 800 million plus shortfall. And again, we have a balanced budget requirement in New Hampshire. We can't just carry this yeah. shortfall forever. Yeah, so what exactly. does government do when they have a shortfall? They go after you and look for the money, yeah. which turns into tax increases. Yeah. So under Maggie Hassan uh, came the LLC income tax. I don't yeah. know if you remember that. I do remember which that. Which was closing a loophole, yeah. which was creating an income tax on the small business owners, the LLC and owners, that, the that, partnerships. And businesses went crazy. Went crazy, right. Yeah, they did. First time ever, I think, a governor um, basically killed a, a, a bill that had already gone into law yeah. killed it because he yeah. realized how bad it would be for the New Hampshire economy. Yeah. New Hampshire is totally based on the small business community. Mm -hmm. And to put this in, it was an eight and a half plus, you know, it actually went up to a 13 mm -hmm. and a half percent tax on the personal income mm -hmm. of these hardworking business owners. Um, that freaked people <laughs> out. Uh, yes. Uh, and I don't know if you remember, there was a campground tax in there as well. Yes. So suddenly yeah. we're going to tax yeah. the dirt yeah, yeah. sleeping every, on Every which way, yeah. Right. It was, so there it was, was nice. a lot of, uh, you know, and that's what people have seen that before. That's what they're afraid of again. They want predictability from government. They want to know that we're being responsible, that there's not going to be surprises at the end. We're not going to go looking for magic money mm -hmm. from them. Um, and so this is what puts this budget at risk. Well, they're kind of almost doing it a little bit already, um, you know, with gas tax proposals oh, and what, <laughs> cigarette tax increases and a little here, a right. little there. You know, you know we the start talking real money. The governor's budget mm. uh, did not include the gas tax, but she she alludes to it yeah. and she yeah. talked about it yeah, and yeah, she seems yeah. to favor it. And that's a huge tax. Yes, it is. Uh, especially at a time when people are really struggling. I mean, our gas prices are huge. Yeah. Uh, for me to fill up my truck is a lot yeah, of money. It, yeah, it is a lot and, of money. And, you know, this tax increase that's been uh, approved just through committee in the House would raise the tax 83 percent, almost double, which is huge. It is huge. And, and again, at a time where all of us have less money in our pocket, mm -hmm. we just got a payroll <coughs> tax increase from the Excuse federal me. government. Mm -hmm. um, it's just unsustainable. I just I don't know where the money's coming from. And then when you dig deeper, you find out that uh, in the governor's budget, she diverts a lot of this money mm -hmm. that, you know, the gas tax is meant to go to roads. And we all care about roads. I think all of mm -hmm. us agree that 
Um, that's an essential and core function of government. We need good mm -hmm. infrastructure. Mm -hmm. But uh, but then to find out that a whole bunch of it, $28 oh, yeah. million dollars or more, yeah. is going to these other promises made. Fish and wildlife <laughs> and so on. <laughs> Which might what be good reasons. What that has to do with me driving a car on the highway, <laughs> right. I haven't quite right. figured out yet. I think yet, people but. want to be assured that the government is not taking their money and then just going on a free-for-all spending. And you know, if, if they commit to doing something, then we want to see it done. And we want to see it done more efficiently than it's done now. Because right now, we, we spend a lot of money on bureaucracy mm -hmm. and, and, you know, and, and things that uh, you know, I think taxpayers would rather see it go mm -hmm. to the asphalt. Mm -hmm. Well, it was kind of interesting that Representative Campbell from Nashua um, has got nailed on his emails and well, such that <laughs> the gift that keeps on giving. Yeah. That's you kind know. of a crazy statement. And that's yeah. why you know, even you know, there are some Republicans in Bedford who may support a bit of a gas tax increase because they do care about the roads, but as soon as they well, hurt, yeah, I mean it is an issue that we have to face, right. and we have all kinds of deficient bridges and everything, and there's no question. But as soon as they heard yeah. that this guy yeah. is laughing about it, oh, and looking yeah. at it as a gift that keeps on giving, um, that's not a gift as a taxpayer. I want to make forever, and mm -hmm. I don't want it to go to the wrong places. So mm -hmm. to divert the funds to other uh, commitments he's made is inappropriate. Of course it is. Yeah. yeah, and I think it's riled people up. I don't. I think people who may have supported it for many reasons uh, have decided that this is not the way to go. No, I think you're right. Yeah, I don't. See, I don't see it passing. At all. I, not, not even not modest. The moment. I yeah. mean, at this point, people are so distraught by what he said that they don't see um, this as a viable solution. Well, it certainly got people angry. You know, and then with the explanation of where some of the money would go, uh, that Absolutely. got people even more and angry. We started to look at this in more detail for the people of Bedford, and we looked at it, and over the next 10 years, it would pull, I think, a billion dollars out of th the pockets of Bedford residents and only give somewhere around 15% back to our roads. This what was that figure of, again? I believe it was a billion dollars. For just Bedford? It can't be a billion. It's got to be a million. Million dollars just wow. in the tax, wow. just in the gas tax. Wow. Million dollars, but you'd only get about fifteen percent back in terms of money for roads and bridges. Obviously, not a fair thing. Yeah, well, it just it's a lot of money at, at the wrong time, and again, without assurances that it's going yeah. to the right thing. Yeah, exactly. A lot of concerns. Now, in the the other parts of her budget, of course, we're hearing so much about the eighty million kind of lost in the storytelling, and at least with the media, the major newspapers and so on. I mean, I do know that, for instance, um, she's restoring funding to the UNH system, mm -hmm. which kind of sends some shivers up my spine, too. I'm sure you want to talk about that a little bit, but what else is floating around in that budget that maybe some of us don't know about but would be surprised to hear. Mm -hmm. Well, there's a lot in there, obviously, and again, that's the detail that we're waiting I, I to know. get. I know. And, and well, I'm, I'm obviously talking about the first look, see, that you're right. getting with, you know, what might be jumping off the pages. Right. Well, you know, and she obviously she made a lot of promises on the yes. campaign trail, so yeah, she's yes. trying to check those all off as yes. she, she creates the budget. And one of those is restoring funding to, funding to the UNH uh, university system. Mm -hmm. And there's been some concerns. I mean, obviously, some people were concerned of how deep the cuts were in the last mm -hmm. two years. But there's some real problems at the university system office, which is the bureaucracy, if you will, that mm -hmm. controls all of the universities in New Hampshire, all the public universities. Mm -hmm. And there were some concerns about waste. There was concerns about they were spending a lot of money on uh, behind the scenes staff mm -hmm. and programs mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that really weren't going to the students. Yeah. You know, we all care yeah, about exactly. the education of the students. Yeah. And a lot of us would rather see the money going directly to the students mm -hmm. who need it. And this whole proposal does not reduce tuition, correct? Well, I think the, the deal, if you will, that was made is that the governor promised to give the money to the to UNH system office and that they they committed to not increasing not tuition Not increase, rates. but it didn't but commit I don't to anything to reduce. Right, exactly. Yeah. So that's a concern because, yeah. you know, obviously all of us want to make sure we have our boys and girls going yeah. to our yeah. colleges and staying in New Hampshire, getting jobs, raising their families here. But when you, um, when you don't make sure the money is going to help them mm -hmm. and it goes to that, you know, the the bureaucracy, if you will, mm -hmm. that's a concern. And I think, you know, we just can't keep throwing money at all of our institutions. No, we have to absolutely take a look. not. And there's some reforms that we need to make. We need to be tighter with the money. And well, we'll you know what, however, you the union leader, and I don't know if other papers do it, but the union leader does. Every year they'll have the listing of all of the, the whole UNH system, all the salaries and everything. 
and it's multi pages long. I mean, first of all, I was shocked at how many people work for the system. It was like, <laughs> right. what? What do, and what do they do? <laughs> yeah, it's like a whole right. section right. of the newspaper, right. you know. But then we, you know, before your eyes give out and you start going down the columns, I mean, we're talking some very, very hefty salaries. Right. And I mean, I look at them and I'm like, whoa. I right. mean, this has to be the most profitable place to work in the whole state, if not New England, for crying out loud. It's interesting. And, you know, a lot of this is in what's called the chancellor's office. So mm -hmm. this is the overarching um, in control office, if you mm -hmm. will, for all of, you know, so UNH, mm -hmm. uh, Plymouth, Keene State, all of mm -hmm. these different organizations fall under this umbrella. And yes, in some cases, by having this umbrella office, you can get economies of scale, maybe in purchasing insurance, uh, or getting a building yeah. contract or getting janitorial supplies yeah. or those types of things. And yeah. In some cases it might make sense, but every single one of our state universities has a very different uh, mission mm -hmm. and focus. Mm -hmm. And you know, so Keene focuses on safety programs mm -hmm. and education, which is very mm -hmm. different from Plymouth, let's say. Mm -hmm. So they are operating very autonomously. So to have a whole lot of overhead mm -hmm. in this chancellor's office it may be too much. Yeah. And I think everyone wants us to take a look at education to make sure it's matching <coughs> the needs Excuse of the business me. community <coughs> better and matching the needs of students better, which could be a little bit less brick and mortar and more maybe some online education or mm -hmm. some more creative programs mm -hmm. that better address the needs of today's society. And I mean, truthfully, maybe a hard look at some of the degrees they're offering too. I mean, and we all read the horror stories about, not just UNH, but every college. I mean, we're all reading about, it, it sounds harsh, but useless <laughs> degrees. Right. Well, you that's know, a matter that, of opinion. Yeah, control. but I mean, yeah. you know, that people will get the degree and it may be wonderful and they may be enriched intellectually and so on, but it doesn't give them an opportunity to get a job. Right. Well, and the other thing is I think society in the last couple of decades has focused entirely on a university education. Mm -hmm. A four-year degree mm -hmm. was what everyone had to do in order mm -hmm. to succeed. And we've found that there's many jobs in New Hampshire that we're not able to fill mm -hmm. because That's right. we really need technical people. That's right. And, you know, some people are good at technical stuff. Some people are That's better right. with other things. And I think we need to have a little bit more flexibility in our expectations of our kids mm -hmm. and then have multiple different facilities out there. And so, you know, the community colleges have done a great job mm -hmm. of innovating you're right. and yeah, being responsive right. to the needs of the students yeah. and their parents and yeah. the employers. Yeah, there seems to be change happening all the time. Lots of change. They're yeah. very dynamic. They understand it's real time. Things have to be done at more convenient times mm -hmm. for the students. Mm -hmm. They need to be made real time. So if it, an employer comes to them and says, hey, I need something and I need, I need people in the next mm -hmm. six months, they can do it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we like to see. And so I think the universities are having a little bit of hard time yeah. evolving. Yeah. Yeah. But that's what we need to do. Now's the time. We can't just keep throwing money at things without taking another look and seeing, is this the time? Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe not. We could do a better job. And, and, you know, you're right what you said about the community colleges because, I mean, when you look back, say, for instance, over the past 10 or 20 years in community, community colleges everywhere, not mm -hmm. just New Hampshire, as, as society has changed, as, as industry has changed and so on, you're seeing them establish new courses of study. Right. That, that, I mean, years ago, none of them offered nursing, for example. And I think all of them do now. I think you're right. And, and a huge source of new nurses coming right. into the medical field. And again, fields. they can change. If, if there's not a need for yeah. nurses now, they can change and fill the need that we need. Yeah, right now, exactly. I think high-tech manufacturing, mm -hmm. using some of this really technical equipment, is mm -hmm. a real need. And so you're seeing those types of programs jumping up all over the place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I mean, uh, it, what you said about the old thinking that if you didn't have that four-year college degree, then you were on a road to nowhere. And that's just plain not true anymore. Right. There are lots of people running around with very expensive degrees who can't get entry-level jobs because they don't have the skills to bring to those jobs, which right. is kind of crazy, <laughs> you know, especially <laughs> right. when you well, consider what tuition recession, is these days. Yeah, I think we have a lot of people going off to graduate school just to continue their education, yeah, and yeah. that's phenomenal. But if it's not turning into job skills, then well, we yeah, have to some worry of them are that. doing it because it's you know they don't have to face the real world yet either, and and of course we all know the phenomena that's going on now. People having to return home, you know, back back yeah. to mummy and daddy because they can't get a job, even at a right. level that you know, will have them live minimally for Yeah, I saw long. a lot of that, you know, going door to door, uh, yeah. getting, reaching yeah. out to voters and chatting with them. Um, I noticed a lot of multi-generational families living at home, 
trying to make ends meet, which is, you know, gets us back to this budget. We just can't keep raising taxes no, on people. It's tight not. out there, and people are struggling. I think a lot of families are working multiple jobs. Mm -hmm. They're cutting back and they're mm -hmm. spending, realizing that that's the right thing to do. I don't think, you know, our governor's budget is just growing and growing and growing, and it's it's on the backs of the taxpayer. Mm -hmm. And uh, we can't keep doing that. Mm -hmm. You know, the other tax we haven't talked about, but there's a big tobacco tax increase. Yeah, yeah. And again, regardless of how you feel yeah. about smoking, yeah. I'm not a smoker. Um, you know, to raise the pack price um, by 20 to 30 cents more than that it is, is a now lot is a huge yes. amount. And what it does, it does have some bad things to the economy. So not only does oh, it there's take, no question about it, yeah. because a lot of money comes into New Hampshire from out of staters. It does buying right. buying their tobacco products here. Yeah, there's no question about and it. And it's not just tobacco. We, well, first of all, we've reached this tipping point. You know, mm -hmm. why would it be worth it for them to drive from mm -hmm. Maine or Massachusetts mm -hmm. to come to New Hampshire if we're pretty close to the price now of somewhere else. It's not worth else. it to them. With the price of gas, yep. if we add a gas tax, yep. why would they bother coming? Yep. Um, but we Especially lose down the, uh, the border. Right. But all borders. You yeah. know, think about it. We're, yeah. we're pretty much uh, yeah, yeah, we've really, got lots yeah, of border towns. Right. Yeah. And they yeah. survive very heavily on these sales. And it's not just tobacco. They certainly do, especially the small business, the right. stores, the grocery right. stores, things like that. Yeah, so it's things like lottery tickets. Yeah. And so yeah. some of this stuff isn't just for the stores and for the local economy. It also will affect other revenue yes, sources it will, of the state. Because when they're here, they're picking up their beer or they're buying their lottery tickets or maybe they're, you know, running to the nearby mall right. um, to take advantage of different things that might not be big ticket items, but nevertheless save the money without up. the sales tax right. and so on. So, yeah, it does add up. So we've it's always huge. talked about the New Hampshire advantage. Mm -hmm. And... Um, Boy, it's eroding right before our eyes. Yeah. And so we're going to, you know, it's challenging. We've already started to see some of our population leave. Mm -hmm. We're not attracting the young families as mm -hmm. much as we used to. And I'd hate to see that trend continue with mm -hmm. higher taxes so that now, no, why, why would they come to New Hampshire? Well, yeah, you know, in fact, uh, you know, my husband and I were having that, that conversation mm -hmm. recently. Like many, many people, particularly in this part of the state, we weren't natives of New Hampshire. I mean, I'm a native of Massachusetts. And... I, I mean, I would say that at least 50% of the people that I've met since living here are from somewhere else originally. And you chose New Hampshire, We right? chose New right. Hampshire. And there were reasons why we did. Now, in so doing, there were certain things that we gave up. You know, we gave up um, wide public transportation systems and street lights on every street and your garbage got picked up for free every, you know, once yeah. a week and so on and so on and so on. Not to mention, you know, the, the ability to get into a big city and see lots of things that you don't get to see in New Hampshire and so on. And, and I said to Jerry one time, I said, you know, if they keep raising the taxes, people are going to go back down. Yeah, what is because, the advantage? Yeah, I mean, yeah. why stay? If those are things that you're now driving to a wish you had mm -hmm. and you still don't have them, well, but yet I'm it's costing <laughs> as much to live here as it costs you to live down there, then there will be people who will live. Yeah, and especially if we can't uh, help our companies produce great exactly. jobs. Exactly. When I say help, it means getting government out of the exactly. way so they can do what they and do best. And aren't the numbers huge for how many people are commuting? You know, it's interesting. I think the number was about 16 percent, which is huge. 16 that is 16 percent of New Hampshire residents actually travel out of state for their work. And anybody on the southern tier, that number got to bump up big time. I think it might. So, you know, that's the thing. We can reverse that. I think mm -hmm. we can fix that. Mm -hmm. And if we can clearly say to the business community, we want you here, mm -hmm. we encourage your growth and success, mm -hmm. they will come, they will stay, they will succeed, they mm -hmm. will grow, they will hire. You know, this, you know, back to the governor's budget. I apologize, but I keep going to go back to that. Oh, um, no, and that's the biggest part of, you know, of, of all the Because it's really what I'm spending year. so much time on yeah. at the State House right now. It's one of yeah. the biggest things that we do there is to make sure we do responsible budgeting. Mm -hmm. And uh, part of her her budget address talked about the fact that she's going to uh, suspend some of the business tax reforms we just passed. These are some major... Well, they're kind of doing that with a vengeance <laughs> this year. You it's know, just... anything that the Republicans pass, somebody's trying to repeal. Yeah, I call it repeal mania. Yeah, <laughs> so really. We can talk about yeah. a few other things it, that they're trying to repeal. Yeah, it's insane. Yeah, it's insane. So there's a number of really great pro-business stuff that we did to encourage responsible business success that mm -hmm. made our state more competitive and more in line with what other states are doing. And um, she's taking those away. So effectively, those are tax increases. Mm -hmm. And the other thing she talked about doing is something that was done just four or five years ago where... Uh, extensive audits of small businesses by the DRA, New Hampshire's mm -hmm. IRS. Mm -hmm. And um, so she wants to uh, 
heavily grow that department and go after the small business community and raise twenty six million dollars and that was one of the hugest things that was accomplished in order to help right. small business was to do away with a lot of that bureaucratic nonsense exactly and as you know i founded and i chair the new yes. hampshire house business caucus yes. which is a group of over a hundred reps from both sides of the aisle yes. and we are very focused on making sure new hampshire is more business friendly so we really promoted these great bills to reduce regulations make our business laws uh, our tax laws more mm -hmm. uh, competitive and fair especially mm -hmm. to the small 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 mm -hmm. companies these mm -hmm. are we're talking about the little people mm -hmm. yeah um, that are doing under mom two, pops, or the mom yeah. and pop stores, yeah. you know, doing under two hundred thousand yeah. dollars in sales a year, and we made some major progress there. And um, and these people aren't getting rich because you know when you think of the what it costs you to be in business and the cost of whatever it is you're providing, right. and employees, hopefully, you right. know, and might have a couple. Costs are going that by the time you know the mom and pop get their end of it, that they're not getting rich. Right. But yeah, these are the regular working families rich. of our state, yeah. and which is the bulk of what we do yeah. here. We don't have a lot of big, big, big companies hiring thousands of people. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of small, five, ten employee mm -hmm. type companies, yep. family run. So you have got yep. mom and dad yep. and the kids yep. and yep. the aunt, <laughs> yeah. and then a few other employees making it happen. And they're wearing many different hats. They're working a ton of hours, mm -hmm. and so it really, you know, so this is really a challenge. So we're basically what she committed to is taking forty-three million dollars out of the small business community wow. to fund. Her her promise programs and you know maybe some of these programs are things you believe in and that's great but you know w taking the money from others it, yeah, it's hard. yeah it's yeah hard. you can't put the cost of it on the back of someone else right. and, and there does seem to be a, a pension for doing that right it, it's right another thing that I kind of got wound up on and, and we recently did a show on um, again something not even an effect when a repeal bill was yeah, lots of filed yeah. um, was for the tax credit scholarship program. Right. I'm sure you have thoughts on that because I it's do. already passed the house. Yeah, it was that's a concern. Uh, it was one. It's one thing to have it as a bill, but the governor also put that in her budget address. Uh, and so that's a major policy change. Yes, it, it was a it's a special program. It was a scholarship program mm -hmm. for yep. low income families. Yep. To give them choices. with strict parameters, very strict yep. parameters. We made sure we carefully vetted to make sure it was constitutional, to make sure that uh, there was there was caps on the amount mm -hmm. of money that would be taken because we didn't want to affect public mm -hmm. education at yeah. all. We want to make sure we have excellence there. So we put all these caps in place. It was just going to start very slowly, have a very minimal financial impact on mm -hmm. the government, but have a very positive impact on these working families mm -hmm. that are trying to make ends meet. And for whatever reason, that particular public public school and their zip code mm -hmm. isn't the right match for their child. And that happens and it can happen for a variety of right. reasons. And you know the wealthy obviously have school mm -hmm. choice anytime that's they right. want. They can you know, pull out that's their right. kid write and write a check yeah. and that's great. Yeah. Um, but for the less wealthy folks um, this is a real challenge and when they've yeah, tried everything and I heard I, I interviewed with a lot of families who are affected by this and you know we made a promise to them. Mm -hmm. Over 400 People have applied. Yes, families that's have what applied. I understand. Yeah. And um, you know, we passed a law. We told them mm -hmm. we were going to do this, and we're ready to go. And now it's being repealed, at least on the House side. And it's discouraging. It's discouraging. Because well, what really concerns me, Laurie, is the fact that the people who are trying to repeal it are very deliberately giving out misinformation. Yeah. I mean, they're saying flat out, oh, it's unconstitutional, or oh, it's taking money away from our schools, or oh, you're giving people free private education, yada, yada, yada. Yeah. And I mean, I believe, uh, well, for the homeschooling end of it, the most somebody can get is $625, right. which isn't going to pay for textbooks and materials and such. And I think that isn't there a, a cap or the average at least for the most needy is something like $2,500. Yeah, that is the average. And yeah. there is no private school that I'm aware of they cost that in this part of the United <laughs> States that it costs twenty five hundred dollars to go to. Yeah, it's interesting, and you know there are a number of charter schools out there though that are in that five, six, seven thousand dollars a year. Um, so you know a twenty five hundred dollars scholarship does make it a helps. big debt, and yes, yeah. especially but, if you've got multiple. But it children. doesn't mean the parent is getting 
free private education for right. their no, kids. They're digging free. deep into their own pockets, right. and it's you know it's going to be a huge commitment for them to do that. It's interesting. It's turned into a real partisan issue yeah. in New Hampshire, which yeah. is unusual. In other states, this is a bipartisan initiative. In fact, you know, generally Democrats want to help the yeah. underprivileged families and give them choices and opportunities that they wouldn't otherwise have, and that's what this scholarship does. Mm -hmm. So to have them repeal it is shocking, actually. Well. Shocking, yes, that they're doing it. Shocking that they're doing it, I would say not so much. Because it seems like anything, anything that has to do with the devil incarnate to the Democratic Party, none other than the former speaker, Bill O'Brien, <laughs> they're going after. <laughs> it's like if, if he even went, can I have a vote? If, if his input was that small, it was a Bill O'Brien oh. thing, and they want to get rid of him. Well, unfortunately, they have demonized him. Oh, my uh, gosh, yes. This is unfortunate. Yes. Yep. Yes. And, well, I mean, you can say what you want about him, but, boy, I mean, he set an agenda, and he got the job he done. He got the job done. He did get it yeah. done. Well, it's interesting. I mean, so it's, it's a tale of woe sometimes for yeah. us in the House because yeah. they, the Democrats are trying to repeal some of the major reforms that yeah. we did. You know, a lot of times the Republicans get blamed for being the party of no. Mm -hmm. But we actually came up with some really good solutions. And yes. And we put this scholarship yes. program as a solution. Uh, but we have the Senate, and the Senate is still a uh, Republican majority. Mm -hmm. And uh, they have committed, so Senate President, Peter Bragdon has committed to not let the good things that we did get repealed. That's good. Yes, it is. That's so good. I believe that but the scholarship will, program will, will keep stay the war going. I hope so. In effect. Yeah, I hope so. I because hope so too. I, and again, I mean, one of the things that bothers me so much is the misinformation. And we heard it at our own school deliberative session, yeah. which you probably know I had much to say that we shouldn't have even been listening to it at our school deliberative session that was supposed to be about the school budget in Bedford, not well, a lobbying effort right. on the people who are against right. the scholarship program. Well, everyone's entitled to their opinion, and we always welcome that. Of course. But we do want it to be based on fact. Yes, exactly, right. exactly. I mean, right. if, you, if you can't defend your argument on fact, then, you know, to my way of thinking, well, stay the hell I out of it. I think people in New Hampshire know what's going on. They're very, I hope very so. intelligent. I think they I can see so. through. I hope they can see through the political maneuvering. Yeah, I hope. Yeah, because this yeah. is just, I, I, I think there's a real effort to get the, the job done properly and do yeah. the right thing for people in New Hampshire. Now, I mean, obviously, there's been some other hot button issues. There going always are. On, yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. Is, is voter ID still one of those ones that have well, people riled up this year? Well, part of that repeal mania. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Still? We made some major progress in, in that regard in the last two years, and yeah. we fully vetted the issues. We want to make sure it was careful mm -hmm. and well thought out. Um, but we do have a problem. We want to make sure that the integrity of your vote mm -hmm. matters and is preserved. Mm -hmm. And we see fraud all the time where mm -hmm. you have people voting twice, mm -hmm. dead people trying to vote, mm -hmm. and, and th that's just what about yeah. the false addresses. The false address. I mean, we still have so many problems, and you know, we're just trying to make a step in the right direction there to just prove that you are who you say you are. Mm -hmm. And um, we and I don't have a problem with that. Yeah, I, I yeah. can't fathom why people yeah. are upset that they would have to show ID at the polls. I mean, it's I don't think most people so are. many states it's done. You know, when I went door to door um, yeah. meeting yeah. with people, I heard a lot of people asking for voter ID. They were they wanted to see that mm -hmm. happen. They wanted to protect the integrity of their vote. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a common sense issue. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some people will blow it out of proportion, um, saying it was really a hardship. But I think even I, I, think I don't get that. What hardship? I, mean, I, I come think on. Lori said that you know everything went well in this last election and it was mm -hmm. pretty seamless. Mm -hmm. And you know some people forgot their IDs, but you know mm -hmm. people will get used to it. They get used to it with other in other mm -hmm. areas that they care about their security and safety. Mm -hmm. Why not here? So um, unfortunately, there are a number of bills to try to repeal that. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hope again. I think you know they, some of these repeal bills might pass the House, mm -hmm. but when they get to the Senate, the the Senate will stay for, strong for us. Of course, I'm kind of hard nosed on that because I mean I I think it's ludicrous that out of state people can go to college here and vote here and determine even local elections. Um, and I understand it has been a problem in places like Plymouth yeah. that that the college community has banded together and voted for various municipal issues in Plymouth that the people who live in Plymouth right. don't want. It does happen and, a and lot. And I, I don't understand what is so difficult about them using an absentee ballot. Right, in and, and some home. of the direction where it shows so this photo ID, which is to yeah. prove you are who you say yeah. you are, that you're a yeah. living live person. Yeah. And then there's the, do you live in this area? Yeah. And do you have a right to vote on local issues? I don't not? think you do. 
Yeah, and so that's where it gets. That's where yeah. some people yeah. are pushing back. Um, we would, yeah, we prefer to, you know, if you if you live in the town, then you register mm -hmm. your car in the town, and mm -hmm. you absolutely mm -hmm. have the the right to vote in that town. But when mm -hmm. you're really not part of this community, it yeah, sets up a you're here temporarily for a couple of years, right. and then it's you know you'll forget where you were. Right. So so we'll see what happens with that, but I think it's going to stay. You think you think it will hold? I think through? we will hold yeah. through because we have the majority in the Senate. Oh, yeah. Well, oh well, yeah. The Senate's uh, last hope, it seems, it is. this year on a lot of <laughs> we things. We call it the Senate? backstop. So yeah, we're you know, just, just be prepared. There's going to be some drama in the House because you're going to have a lot of this kind of thing um, where they're going to repeal what, some of the reforms we did. There's going to be a lot of angst. Mm -hmm. uh, but in the end, I believe the Republican majority, it'll be, it's a slim majority, but I think they'll hold together because we spent so much effort mm -hmm. on what we think are mm -hmm. really good reforms that most people care about. We just don't want to see that all undone. What are the other issues that state reps are getting the most emails or most comments or whatever? Boy, wrong? there is such a range. Sometimes I, know. I will get emails on something that I didn't realize was a hot button issue. Uh, but apparently, uh, recreational diving for lobster is a big issue. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> I have received hundreds of emails about this. I can honestly say I have <laughs> not had a sleepless <laughs> night over that issue. I hadn't either. I don't even know anybody <laughs> who knows about that issue. And it's interesting, in this particular case, I don't think any of the emails I've received have been from Bedford or Amherst. <laughs> uh, but from all over the state, they do emails and they, you know, they will lobby their points about why they feel they should be able to dive recreationally for an occasional lobster. <laughs> right now they can. <laughs> and apparently this bill has come up many, many times and it has been Seriously. denied. Seriously. And so you never know what's gonna be important to people. I, I would <laughs> not have thought that would have been a hot button right. issue in 2013. Right. I really would not have. Right. So you just uh, never know. Yeah. You know, um, you know, a lot of questions on gambling. We have one of our state reps who wanted to promote Kino yeah. in New Hampshire. Yeah. And so a lot of talk about Actually. that. Actually. Two of our Bedford reps. Two of our Bedford reps sponsored that bill, and you know we took a look at it, and it just hasn't been studied at all in New Hampshire, and we thought we should probably walk before we run. I on that. think so. Um, you know, again, no one's necessarily opposed to gambling, uh, mm -hmm. or in some cases, people would talk about that as a lottery mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. um, but again, it just we want to be cautious, we want to be careful, and once you open the door mm -hmm. on something like it's that, you just want to make sure you do it right. Right, yeah. exactly. Which brings yeah. up another hot button issue, which is of course is medical marijuana. Oh yeah, which we've that's seen a biggie. Before, yes, yes. And uh, yes. you know, very controversial. Yeah. And yes, so it I is. have yeah. received a lot of emails on that one, and. Uh, you know, it's it's kind of 50-50 on that one. So again, yeah, it still is. Yeah. It seems to be right down the middle. Wow. There are uh, a lot of people who like the idea, I mean, simply because there are medical cases out there mm -hmm. where apparently marijuana helps these people mm -hmm. survive. That, that's what I've heard. And yeah. so, you know, of course, how can you look away from that and not want to listen to their stories and understand what they're going through and see if you can help? Mm -hmm. Uh, on the other hand, there's always the fear of proliferation. Mm -hmm. uh, do you mm -hmm. want people, you know, how do you want to disperse this stuff? Mm -hmm. Do you want it to be carefully controlled? I think most people do. Mm -hmm. But do you want people to be able to grow it themselves? Do you want it to be through a one state that dispensary? That kind of creates all kinds of, right, all sorts surrounding of surrounding issues. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the question of right now, to the best of my knowledge, there's no way to test if someone's under the influence when they're driving. Yeah. So obviously yeah, we all that have to me would be a serious concerns portion. if yeah. someone you yeah. know, drives under the influence of alcohol. Yeah. We all concern about that. So then how how would we know if someone yeah. is inappropriately? If it's highly controlled, if it's only for severe medical cases, maybe it's really not an issue, but yeah, you know, the jury's still out on that. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where mm -hmm. that's going to go. And again, just like the gambling debate, mm -hmm. the devil will be in the details on exactly what this bill is going to look like. But the governor has said that she is open-minded mm -hmm. uh, in a highly controlled atmosphere. Well, even if it's highly controlled, I mean, there are prescription drugs that are very highly controlled. And yet, um, ask any police chief, and and you know, I've I've heard um, interviewed the other just last. Last night, two nights ago, Dave Mara, who's mm -hmm. the chief of Manchester uh, Police Department, and our own Chief Perfonsky and so on, and they point to prescription drug abuse right, which is a, a problem. major problem right. and the cause of lots of things, burglaries, house breaks, et cetera, et cetera, right. et cetera. So, I mean, even if it's tightly regulated, doesn't it kind of put that right into that category where we're already seeing an increase of all kinds right. of problems? And, and drugs are scary, you know, yeah, they someone, are. they're yeah. very addictive, yeah. and some people will tell you that marijuana is a gateway. 
drug. Well, well yeah, a lot of people believe that. Yes, a lot of people do believe that. Things. And again, that's yeah. one of those arguments that's been going right. on for 30 years. Right. Some people say absolutely not, and other people say don't kid yourself. And I don't know who's right. right. I, I honestly don't. It's a don't. challenge. And I, I actually ask police officers all the time because I think mm -hmm. they might have the best way to give me some feed, real life, mm -hmm. you know, common yeah. sense kind of feedback. Yeah. What do they Absolutely. see on the streets? Yeah. And um, it's very mixed mm -hmm. uh, because I think some people, again, you want to help the people who mm -hmm. really need the help. And, mm -hmm. and if this is a way to do it, I think all of us are open minded, but we just don't want to open the door to something like what's happened in Colorado where you, there's a marijuana shop everywhere mm -hmm. on the street. Everyone is yeah, able to get access to it. Yeah, I would hate to, to see it. that. That would be crazy. Yeah, that's just, that's not New Hampshire. That's yeah. not who we are. But you have other states who've been able to control it very well. So we'll see. Hmm. Um, we are quickly getting into the time zone that we have to uh, kind of Well, this is going think by about. quickly. Doesn't it go by? <laughs> it does, I know. Everybody's <laughs> always amazed. They think a whole hour show is going to be long. Yeah, but there's so the much to talk flies. about. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'm, I'm looking at the clock, and I'm thinking, I know you have a ton of ideas. I know you have issues that I'm sure you think we should have got to today and haven't made it because the time is running out. So what I want to do is give you a couple of minutes to basically close out the show oh, great. and look at the camera and tell the people of Bedford and everybody else will see the show what they should be doing or what they should be watching. Well, I'm doing the hard work, uh, but I just want your feedback all the time. I really appreciate your taking the time to tune in. Again, my name is Representative Lori Sanborn, and I'm here to serve you. I want to hear from you. I want your input and ideas and feedback on anything that we're doing at the State House. Uh, you know, my job is to make sure we're taking care of the real problems that you're facing. To me, the number one issue that we're all dealing with is the economy. And I'm going to do everything I can to make sure New Hampshire is the best possible place to find a job, start a company, grow, hire. And, uh, but we have a lot of work to do. We have a budget that we're facing that uh, will spend over, I think, a 10% increase in spending from the last biennium. Uh, a lot of new tax increases. Uh, it, the governor's budget is based on a large single casino in the state. So we're looking at all those things and we're going to try to do the best thing for the long-term interest of you and New Hampshire. And again, I want your feedback, I want your input, I want your ideas. My thought is we really do need to take a look at everything very carefully and reform wherever we can. We need to reduce the wasteful spending. We need to be very cautious and careful with, with your hard-earned dollars. That's what we're there to do is to protect you. And again, you can reach me. I don't know if it's on the screen, but at repsanborn at yep. gmail.com. Mm -hmm. I'd love to hear from you, and I thank you for the opportunity. Great job. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Well, uh, for those of you who are watching, um, you will have noticed by the time you see this show that lately I've had a couple of Republican spokesmen uh, addressing issues, and I'm not trying to be biased. Um, I also had Chris Pappas, who's a Democrat, um, in, and he talks about things from the Governor's Council perspective. And so that you know, I have invited uh, the chairman of the Democratic Party, uh, Ray Buckley to also come on the show and present the Democratic perspective. I haven't received an answer yet. Hopefully he'll come because we do want the show to be fair. Um, as far as our, our local delegation, I guess you know they are all Republicans. So um, it's not like I could go to one of our <laughs> local reps who's a Democrat and say, come on in. So um, I did the next best thing and asked the chairman. But we will try to, to give you um, both sides of the view. Um, but I think Laurie has done a fantabulous job of uh, <laughs> representing her party and her point of view here today and how she's representing us well in Concord. But I do want to say I do represent every single person regardless of That's party. Correct. So please never hesitate to reach out. Good point. And, mm -hmm. and she is very accessible and um, always answers phone calls and emails. Absolutely. All right. Thank, thank you, Thank you again. Appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you for watching. I hope you learned something today or maybe you got some nuances of some of this legislation and the budget that you didn't know yet. Uh, so keep on watching because we'll keep it coming at you because we do like telling it like it is. Till next time, bye-bye. <laughs>